Uh, so now that Antoine's taken you a bit through the routing layer, I'm going to run you through a bit of what the Lightning Network is looking like today. So this is looking at topology of the network, how we got to be, where we got to be, the creation of the network, and some approaches to maintaining this network to look the way that we want it to look. So a very quick recap on Lightning Channels. They are funded on-chain with the funding transactions. You then maintain a series of commitment transactions off-chain. And then finally, when you decide to terminate the channel, you close them on-chain. So ideally, there are only two transactions involved in every single Lightning channel. This is our absolutely ideal case. If something goes wrong along the way, we're going to have a few more. However, even though we are a layer two um, scaling solution, you do want to make sure that we have as few of these channel opens and closes as, ne as possible. Right, to minimize the footprint we have on the network. So we want to do this, and we want to make sure that the topology of the network enables routing so that we don't have to constantly be opening and closing channels to make Lightning Network payments. It's really frustrating when you want to make a payment in your Lightning node. You can't do it, then you just have to open a channel anyway. You still have to wait 30 minutes for it to confirm, and then you're losing a lot of the good UX, and you're clogging up the blockchain with another Lightning channel. So. What I really think is important is that we open and close channels wisely. What another thing in the Lightning Network, which is an interesting distinction to touch on, is that between public and private channels. So public channels are known to the network. They're announced on the Gossip Protocol using something called a channel announcement. And this announcement is agreed on by both of the nodes in the channel. So this means we intend for other people to use this channel. We intend for them to route through it. And we hopefully intend to earn some feeds from it. This is very, very different to a private channel, which is not announced to the network. If you have a peer that tries to announce your public channel to the network, you just don't sign that announcement. And as per the protocol, people should ignore the announcement. So these channels will not be included in the public graph. People don't want to be routed through. They just want to use the network and go about their business. Um, so this means when we look at the topology of the network, we can only look at the public channels. Because when you want to look at the topology, you, run up, you set up a lightning node. You call it describe, uh, describe graph endpoint or something of the sort to get the nodes and the, and the channels. And that's what you work with. And that's kind of annoying because you want to see some of the really interesting things in the network, such as like mobile clients, which all connect with private channels pretty much, and the Eclair mobile client, where a whole bunch of clients connect to one really well-run node. So they have a single private channel. So you don't get to see a lot of those topological elements. But it's also really good. These people get to use the Lightning Network, and it's not our business what they're doing with it. They've got a private channel, and I think that's a, you know, the Lightning Network is achieving what it needs to achieve in terms of privacy by allowing a construction like this. So with this construction of private and, and public channels comes this dichotomy of nodes or classification. So there's the idea of a personal node, which you typically run on your phone or just at home. And this is a node which would have private channels, you're not, you're not going to want to put a lot of effort into it. You just want to be able to use Lightning to buy beer or other things. Um, and you don't really aim to earn many fees on it. However, a public node, which we're going to refer to as a routing node, would set up some, private, some public channels. It would manage capital well. It would really intelligently open these channels, hope to get a lot of payments, hope to earn some fees. You know, not quite running at a profit right now. Fees are very low in Lightning, but hopefully one day we can have higher fees in Lightning so that the running these nodes is incentive compatible. So we're not just relying on people running them because it's fun. It would be great if they also earned a significant amount of fees running them. And I think that through the intelligent creation of public channels, you can definitely drive that a lot more. Uh, in terms of pathfinding and routing, which Antoine's just touched on, uh, we do source-based routing in the Lightning Network. However, we have unknown channel balances. So when you commit to that finding transaction, that amount that you commit is what you broadcast to the network. You don't tell them how much is on either side, which means that there are going to be a lot of failures in the Lightning Network when you route. Because you might try and route through a channel where all of the Bitcoin are actually on the other side, so then you can't route in that direction. There's nothing further to assign to that peer in that direction. Um, although these amounts are private, uh, they're not announced, it is possible to figure them out right now. So you can run something called a probing attack, which we ran on testnet during the residency, where you route a lot of failing payments through a specific edge and back to yourself. And then you, you know they're going to fail because you've given a bad pre-image. 
but you route them through with varying amounts, doing sort of a binary search or something like that, and the minute you hit a range where the payment stops coming back to you and start failing with a certain error, you know that that's kind of the range of the amount that they're sitting in. This can be addressed, and I think they're looking into it in the spec and sort of making errors more generic uh, so that you can't achieve this. But at the moment, just know that it is possible to figure out balances, even though we're trying to hide it, because you can de-anonymize payments if you can trace changing balances through the Lightning Network. And then finally, uh, because we don't know our channel balances, when we route, we optimize for fees and time locks. These are both advertised to the network, and they can be updated using something called a channel update message on the network. And so this is how we figure out how we're going to route. So when we look at the Lightning Network, the public topology really matters. Um, it affects your ease of pathfinding. It affects the success of payments that you have in the network. It influences your fees a lot. If you're very badly disconnected in the network, you're going to have to pay much higher fees. And it also affects the resilience of the network. If the network is sitting relying on a very small number of routing nodes, if one of those goes down, we're not only going to see a very big decrease in payment success, but it also opens us up to all sorts of nasty chain analysis folks and the like watch, trying to watch our transactions. So, a brief overview of the topology. This is about a month old. Uh, I ran this a while ago, but there are 5,600 nodes. There are 35,000 public channels, and there's about 960 Bitcoin sitting in those channels. And I use a great tool called Allen Topology, which you can find on GitHub, written by someone called Istvan Andres Serez, to run some deeper analysis on what the network actually looks like. So the first thing we look at in a graph is the diameter of this graph. And that is defined as the shortest, longest path. So in the picture I've got here, the longest path between any two nodes in the network is three, and from B, C, F to G. And this means that if any node in the network is trying to contact any other node, the longest path that they can efficiently take is, is the diameter. And in Lightning, this is 11. So we're limited to 20 hops, although we can extend the hop count a bit with some cool spec tricks. But it's good to know that we are sitting well within this limit in the Lightning Network. Um, another thing we look at is radius, which is the longest, shortest path. So in this picture, node F can reach any other node in the network with two hops. And this value in the Lightning Network at the moment is six, which means that there is a node somewhere in the network which is connected such that it is at maximum six hops away from any other node. Now, this is not taking into account fees and time locks, which obviously would factor in, but that does give you kind of a, an idea of the extent of this network. Two things worth mentioning here. These are fairly gameable metrics, both of them. I don't see why someone would want to drive up the diameter of the Lightning Network, um, but you can do so fairly trivially by just creating a few nodes and creating a very long chain. So picture if I added a very long chain at the end of this graph, suddenly the diameter would blow up. Um, you know, it will cost you a bit to do it. I don't know what you'd achieve, but you know, it's always worth knowing that these are very much worst case metrics and might be produced by strings of nodes rather than the actual state of the network. And another thing that we consider when calculating these is that your graph has to be connected when you calculate them. If there's one node which isn't connected to anyone, your diameter will be infinity because that node is totally unreachable. Reachable. So when I ran this code, I had to get rid of about 25 connected components, which had about 70 nodes in them. So you have to exclude those to get these numbers. I would assume these sort of strange clusters of nodes are connected back to the main body with private channels. But again, that's not something you can really tell. In terms of connectedness, the Lightning Network has a density of 0 0.011 which is pretty low. So density measures the total number of edges you can possibly have in a network. I'm sorry, it's the ratio of edges you have to number of edges you can possibly have. So this value can range from zero to a totally unconnected graph to one, which is the picture I've got on the left, which where every single node is connected. And this is a really, really low value for the Lightning Network, but I think it's a pretty good value to have. As I said at the beginning of this talk, you do want to minimize your on-chain footprint. So if we are managing to route with a very low number of channels, that's a good thing. If we saw this, this number going up very dramatically, it might indicate that we're opening channels that we don't actually need. The other thing we can look at is bridges. So bridges refers to edges. So a bridge edge is one that if you remove it from the set, you produce another connected component. So in this picture, if I remove one six, then the six node will be totally excluded from the network and they can't they're not connected anymore. 
Lightning's got a really high number of bridges. This is not great. It's got 1,800 bridge or 1,880, I think it is, out of 5,600 nodes. So this means that that many nodes are connected to the network by a single public channel. They may also be connected by a private channel, but I would say that we'd probably want that number to go down as the network grows. You don't want people hanging around the periphery and just relying on a single channel if they have a public channel. Um, in terms of degree, so degree is the number of peers that each node in the network has. This is a really interesting graph to me. Uh, it's log scale, so just be aware, be warned. Um, but if you can see here, the 10 to the 1, everything to the left of that are nodes that have 10 or less channels, and everything on this side of the graph are the nodes that have much higher numbers of channels. Um, and this is really um, indicates that we have a lot of nodes with a few channels, and then a very small majority of nodes with a ton of channels. Um, and that's indicative that we have something called a hub and spoke network. Um, I've highlighted one of the larger, the more connected nodes in this picture, but I will warn you that these, these images are not very good representations because all the lines cross over and it makes the hubs look a lot more hubby than they are. But generally it's a structure that looks a bit like this, where one big node has many connections and then smaller nodes connect to that node. So you can think of Satoshi's place. If the Blockstream store node was public, which I don't think it is anymore, then you could connect to that. And this is further supported by the assortativity of this graph, which is a value between negative one and one. This measures the tendency of nodes to connect to nodes with similar degrees. If it's a positive number, it means that low-degree low nodes connect to other low-degree nodes. And if it's a negative number, it means the reverse. High-degree nodes connect to low-degree nodes. And the Lightning Network has that value sitting at negative 0.23. So in that range, it is definitely showing that people who have less connections are connecting to these larger hubs. So how did we get here? When the Lightning Network first started out, it was very much uh, achieved through manual connections. So people would connect to their friends, they'd connect to people they know, they would post their URIs on, online and get people to connect to them. Um, but then in 2017, LND, which is one of the implementations that we have today, one of the three main implementations we have today, added something called Autopilot. And this is something to automate the way in which you connect to nodes. And it worked on a system called preferential attachment, which meant that you would become more likely to connect to nodes which had a lot of, which had a lot of channels open already and had a lot of liquidity. And this kind of drove the development of this hub and spoke network as well. Uh, at the time, it was intended as a first run at autopilot. And the original commit says, we probably shouldn't go ahead with this. <laughs> well, we probably shouldn't use this, but it's a first run at it. Uh, but then the network kind of blew up a bit and people started really using it. So this hub and spoke topologies really started to emerge. And the final factor is liquidity providers. So in the Lightning Network, when you connect and you open your first channel, all your funds are on your side and you can't actually receive, which is kind of annoying if you want to receive. So there are a few companies out there which will open a channel to you, providing you with incoming liquidity. One of them is Alan Big, another one is Bitrefill, have an out-of-band payment for a service called Lightning Thor. And if you pay them, they'll open up a channel to you. However, because this was a really unique user experience flaw and only a few people were doing it, a lot of people opened up channels with these nodes. And now Alan Big has something crazy, like 24, 25% of the capacity on the Lightning Network is in their channels. Um, so that also really drove this hub and spoke thing that we see today. So maintenance of the network is an interesting one. It's kind of important to distinguish between channel health and network health at this point. So channel health is on an individual level. If you're running a node, you want your channel to connect to people who are online a lot, because if they're offline, you actually can't update that commitment state, so it's completely unusable. And you want your channel to be pretty balanced. So you want Bitcoin on either side so that people can route through you and you can earn fees. Whereas network health is setting up a topology within the network which is conducive to routing, it's resilient to attack, all of these things. So whereas when you look at channel health, it's on the individual level, it kind of takes topology as a given, whereas topology help is trying to arrange these channels in a way that makes sense, regardless of how healthy they are. And at the moment, changing topology definitely has a really significant cost. If we decided to scrap the Lightning Network, close all the channels, let's go, 
it would be at least 35,000 transactions on chain. And even on a Sunday night, that's not going to clear. That's going to really drive up fees pretty significantly. Um, and kind of if you're trying to scale Bitcoin, the way not to do it is to close 35,000 channels. Um, so it's something that is already decided, but I think it's important to move forward opening and closing channels wisely. So we can't just start from scratch, but we can definitely improve on what we've got and try to remove some of the aspects of this hub and spoke network. I don't think we're ever going to move entirely away from it because larger merchants and stores and providers will always have you know, this kind of structure. But I think moving away from it will largely increase the resilience of the network. And so when you open channels, there's a few ways that we can proceed. We can leave this manual, so just leave it up to people. I've got two issues with this. Um, the first is that people will tend to de-anonymize themselves. A lot of people are the only Bitcoiner they know in their friendship groups. So you end up putting your node ID on Twitter or on Slack and you, know, you immediately de-anonymize yourself. I never did that. I never tweeted my node ID. Um, but you immediately associate yourself with your, with your node ID and IP, which is just straight de-anonymization. While people should be responsible for their own privacy, I think it's important to provide it by default for less educated users, especially when you're getting into a new space like Lightning. The other one which is slightly less talked about is the fact that Lightning is a payments graph. It's not a social graph. So there's really interesting work about the graphs that Twitter and Facebook have and the triangles and the favorable routing conditions. But we don't really know that graphs underpinned by the intention to transact will have the same structure because you might not open a Lightning Network uh, node, uh, channel with your friend. Their channel might suck. Um, so you will probably end up perpetuating the same hub and spoke network anyway because people will tend to connect to these larger providers. Uh, another idea for autopilot is to use second degree preferential attachment. This is like preferential attachment, but instead of connecting to the most connected node, you connect to nodes who are peered and, op and have channels open with very connected nodes. So this spreads the hub and spoke out of it. It kind of makes that heat map a bit broader, but it still does drive that general topology of nodes that are more connected receiving better positioning in the network. Uh, so something that Rene Picard is working on in a really great C Lightning plugin is looking at an autopilot which uses graph level metrics to inform channel opening and closing decisions. He's got two categories. He covers uh, connections that are good for the network as a whole and connections that are good for you as a routing node. So in terms of network as a whole, the first one is just randomly connect, which has got some great um, properties for the really spreading that hub and spoke network out. And the second one is to connect in a way which decreases the diameter of the graph. And I think that's really interesting because every time you open a channel in this way, you're wrapping the graph in on itself and closing up that diameter a bit. It is obviously a bit gameable. If someone maliciously wanted to force you to open, well, force this logic to open a channel to you, you can again create that long string of nodes. But you know, I'm sure you can get around that fairly easily. You can have some sanity checks in there. And although it is really good for the network to keep the diameter small, I think it would also have some pretty interesting implications for routing, right? If you suddenly wrap the two furthest away points in the network together, you don't know how many shortest paths you're going to end up on. In terms of things that are purely good for you as a routing node who intends to, um, to maximize fees, you would connect to nodes with high betweenness centrality. So a node with high betweenness centrality sits on a really high portion of the shortest paths in the network. So my picture, the blue one is in the middle because all of these nodes on either side, if they want to route shortest paths to those nodes, it sits on that path. And if you connect to a node like the blue one, then you are probably going to sit on a lot of shortest paths as well because you're sort of bringing those two things together. And finally, his uh, autopilot does also use preferential attachment because it is, it is nice to be connected to the big players in the network or at least near them to kind of get in the thick of it. Um, and he combines these all in a way that is configurable for users, which is really nice. So you can set your own preferences. And I think it's a really great direction to be moving in. Another direction which takes a different approach is that of node scoring. So uh, the LMD development team, the Lightning Labs team, have used something called buzz scores, uh, which are publicly released scores, although the way in which they're calculated or not. However, you can make some guesses as to how they score individual nodes in the network. Uptime is a big one as I said before, so making sure that you're connecting to nodes online. And I believe they also do some basic probing to figure out who are the more balanced nodes in the networks. They run some very small probes. I think 
it's every two weeks, I'm not really sure. Um, and they try and figure out who's got slightly more balanced channels and they score them well because of this. Again, potentially gameable. If you figure out what metrics they're using, you can try and increase your score. However, it's hard for me to see the attack here because you get a good score by behaving really well. And why would you want someone to open a channel to you except for earning routing fees by being in a channel with them? And if you suddenly degrade your performance after they've opened a channel, then you're not going to earn the fees you want to earn in the first place. Um, so that's another way of doing it. I think their mobile app currently uses this list, and it is publicly available. Right, and finally, closing channels. This is something that I'm pretty interested in, and I worked on during the Chain Code residency. Um, because when you close a channel, you incur an on-chain fee. Uh, you also potentially lock up your funds with a delay if you have to unilaterally close. And you incur an opportunity cost of maybe that channel would have earned you a lot of fees. But also you have this, on the opposite side, you have this opportunity cost of what if you've got all your capital locked up from this channel, which isn't earning you anything. Perhaps you should move it. And all of those are pretty difficult uh, things to think about as a person. I worked on a mainnet lightning integration and we kind of had these few channels which weren't producing anything. And it takes you a long time to pull the trigger on a channel because you've opened it, it's routed like two payments. You feel like you should be getting more for that, but you, know, you don't also don't really want to close it because what if it works? What if one day it works? Um, so what I really worked on this summer was a system of scoring channels, which would hopefully eventually inform autopilot as to when we're going to make the decision to close the channel. And I looked at four dimensions. So the first was reliability, which is the uptime of the remote peer in your channel, because if they're not online, you can't do anything with that channel. The next was success rate. So the number of successes that the HTLCs that you route through that channel have versus the number of failures. This one is also a bit iffy because obviously the failures can be further down the line. However, if maybe that, that node is connected to one specific channel which keeps failing by association, you might want to close this channel if it's not serving you well. Uh, profit and volume is a fairly easy one for routing nodes. So the amount of profit you make, the amount of fees, um, and the amount that moves through this specific channel. And these two have to be calculated relative to the amount of Bitcoin you have in that channel because it's not really fair, higher Bitcoin, higher amount channels would have higher volume going through them probably just because they have more capacity. And then finally, utility, which isn't really that all that important for a routing node. But if you are a user of the Lightning Network who has a public channel open and you make a specific payment to a node every day to buy a cup of coffee, to buy a beer, you don't want to close that channel because it's not earning you routing fees because you might end up paying a whole bunch more fees routing around to them or not able to pay them at all. Uh, so those are the four things I looked at. And getting back to our split of nodes, so a personal node and a routing node, I think that you would weight these slightly differently based on your use. And this logic applies across private and public channels. I think that's worth mentioning. So pub private channels you wouldn't route through. So you would want a reliable peer and you would want to get utility. You'd still be sending your own payments. So you'd want success and you'd want to be using the channel a fair amount, but it's much less important when it's just your own payments. Whereas a routing node, also you have to have a reliable peer. This is kind of non-negotiable in Lightning. If your peer is flapping on and offline, you've just got to cut them. I think the network is stable enough that you can find good peers. So it's really not something that anyone should leave their capital locked up with an unreliable node. But then for a routing node, you'd be much more concerned with the success of your payments and the volume and fees that you earn from it and much less concerned with the utility you're getting. So the personal sends you make from that node would make up a much smaller portion of the sends that you do overall, hopefully, because you're routing a lot of payments. So that would be much less important for a routing node. Yeah, so TLDR, <laughs> Lightning Network is having, a, it looks like it has a hub and spoke topology at the moment. This topology is pretty expensive to change. And I think that some really you know, nifty autopilot enhancements could really improve the way that we open and close channels to both improve the health of this network and decrease the on-chain footprint of the Lightning Network. Thank you. Um, when you were speaking about the privacy with regards to opening the channels, um, is there any shift in the development where uh, both projects, I'm referring to C-Lightning and LND, 
would sort of like enforce the regular users. So whoever comes by, downloads the software, will be forced to use on Android. Because now when you unpack it, and like even like if you're sort of a developer but not like really interested in the insides, when you just run it from box, from out of the box, there's no unenrouting enabled, right? You have to use some options. So do both teams sort of like think that they should really make the non unenrouting version being like a developer option so they can tweak things, but really becoming uh, the, the onion thing a default? Because otherwise, we're, we're not going to educate the users that they have to use it. It has to be just built in. There should be like no option. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I'd say that the non-Tor Lightning node is a developer mode. Um, I'd say that the Tor Lightning node is the developer mode because it's the harder one to run. Um, but I definitely think that trying to have uh, Lightning nodes over Tor by default would be a really good thing for privacy if just out of the box it came like that. Obviously, each implementation would have to sort of set their priorities. And I think that, unfortunately, not that I can speak for either, but there's just a lot else to be done in the spec right now. So I think it would be wonderful, but I do not see it coming up soon, in my personal opinion. You mentioned that, you mentioned that uh, the Lightning Network RAP is not a social network, it's a payment network. Mm. And uh, do you think that it, it will be obfuscating the payment network? The routing will become less efficient? Uh, do you think, oh, so do you think like not having that intention to transact purely reflected in the topology will make routing less efficient? Is that the question? Uh, I think to a degree it would. Obviously, if we wanted to have the most efficient routing in the world, we'd all connect to one node, right? We'd all connect to one centralized node. So that's kind of a trade off that you have to make is do you want to be really decentralized and totally independent of the failure of any node? And do you want to do that at the expense of longer routes? Or do you want to maybe have more nodes that you rely on, you know, more central nodes that you, or more connected nodes that you rely on, and then e it is easier to route. But I think that a well-connected Lightning network, which has got a fairly random <coughs> topology, technically routing shouldn't be terrible. You're probably going to have to retry once or twice when you uh, create a route, but it's, if channels are, are well-maintained and set up in a fairly good way, then it should be fine. But it is an inherent trade-off. If you want privacy, you don't get convenience. So I think uh, what I said about uh, uh, publishing your uh, uh, node in Twitter or something like this, I think there should be people hosting like uh, an anonymous uh, list that anyone can anonymously add their channel to the list without an identity. So anyone that wants to open more than one channel, more than the, the, the one, the, the default uh, of the wallet application, which my, most users, I believe, do. And so I think this will be a great benefit uh, to, to the Lightning Network. Do there is something like this? Uh, I mean, yes, there's definitely public lists available. And when you spin up a node, you can see all of the nodes out there. The, the problem of announcing your channels, well, not announcing your node ID, rather, specifically relates to um, inbound capacity, often. Because you can figure out who to, who to open a channel to. You can just randomly pick someone off a list. But to get someone to connect to you, then you need, you need to give them the identity they need to connect to. And liquidity providers do do that. You just give them your, you just put your pub key and your IP in a website, and you click, please open a channel to me. And they do open it, and you don't have to give them your Twitter handle or anything like that. So that's a specifically liquidity-related issue. Um, I mean, there is part 10 on the automatic DNS bootstrap, but as far as I know, it's just implemented by an engine right now. It's like, you know, you call your DNS, you fetch uh, a service query, and you get back a random set of lightning nodes. So you mentioned a few um, statistics on the graph, like the damage and stuff, uh, but they're easily gameable. Have you looked into like random blocks on graphs and like uh, cap centrality, like more um, actually taking from the Facebooks and the Twitters? Mm. Like, there's a lot of research done there. And yeah, I haven't personally looked into it. Um, in terms of those graphs, those metrics being gameable, it, I more mean that they may not necessarily represent the most accurate picture of the Lightning Network if there is one of these long chains throwing out the diameter, just when we're trying to get like a mental model of what it looks like. Um, 
I haven't looked at the literature in terms of that. I've been looking at the closing channel side of things, but I'm sure there's great lessons to be learned. You said that node scoring is not gameable. Well, let's say the, the, the current state, at least, that I understand is that we have one ML, and it's closed source, and it ranks the nodes uh, according to various uh, mm. metrics that we don't know because the code's closed source. How do you think that's going to evolve? Like, is there going to be an open source one ML? Like, are we going to have the same problems with Google, where uh, one company has a lot of power in terms of determining who's successful and who's not, without actually being transparent on how they're determining that? Uh, well, my hope would be that node scoring is built into some of the implementations, be it directly in the implementation or in a plugin, because that's all open source, so we can all see what we're scoring. Because um, it really is just a way to inform dumb software how to connect to things that you need to figure out. Um, in terms of certain parties you know, ca capturing the market, I think that if you look at a lot of the dimensions that nodes score um, upon like uptime and channel balances, these are things that individuals can do, right? They're like very achievable goals. It's not like one person's going to have this huge competitive advantage where they manage to like blow all of the scores out of the water. If you're up 100% of the time, you're up 100% of the time. However, I do think that along lines of something like liquidity, you know, so the amount of Bitcoin you have, you definitely could see like very large companies um, sp spinning up huge nodes which are very connected, which it's very easy to route through. But I think that if the Lightning Network is resilient in the absence of those nodes, so if we don't just connect to those really big nodes, we actually do connect in a more intelligent way, in a slightly more random way, then we, to a degree, prevent those hubs from emerging, and then we do not de become dependent. Because if we do become dependent, we are actually in a bit of trouble. So I think some of, some of the metrics are very achievable for entry-level users, and the more challenging ones, like liquidity, we shouldn't be scoring very heavily on those. Um, to my knowledge, buzz scores aren't, the way they calculate them isn't public. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm incorrect in that one. The scores themselves are public, but the way you calculate is not. Uh, yeah, I think you, you plug in your, your own scoring things. Oh, oh, so that's a different thing. So in the LND implementation, you can feed in your own set of scores. Yeah. So there's an interface, and you can do that. If you want to score however you want, you want to inform your own older pilot, that structure's there. So you can just put in whatever scores you want. And like, so Lightning Labs and their mobile app, they put in the buzz scores, but you could easily create your own scoring system and feed it in. Time. Assuming it gets competitive in the future, though, like it'll just, if, if it gets competitive and everyone's at a similar level in terms of the main metrics, then it's going to be some of these less important metrics that are going to determine whether you're on the first search page or like the third page. Yeah, and I think that's where great things like randomness come in, right? Giving everyone a chance and, could, yeah, but offline, time's up. Thank you. Thank you.